So good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I am, well, as I said, I'm Andy, and one of the things I do, uh, among many other things, is I also teach English. And uh, I graduated a couple of years back from the University of Kelenia uh, with a degree in English. And today I thought I'd share with you some of the things that I learned while studying there. Uh, so during my years as an undergraduate in the English department. So, I, and I also wanted to share with you some thoughts on you know, things happening in post-war Sri Lanka as well. Because I think that's also some of the things that I was told to talk about. So I started working as an English lecturer while I was still a student. I'll speak to you more about that a little later. Uh, but before I begin to speak to you, let me share with you one of the things that I was to asked uh, when I first started teaching. And I swear this still gives me nightmares. Uh, so actually, yeah. So I was asked this question. So what are the B verbs? So I'm going to just put that to you as well. What are the B verbs? And I was just stumped. I was like, okay, I'll, 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 um, I'll get back to you. You know, it's, it's a very difficult question. So it kind of got me thinking, you know, about language and English in Sri Lanka. And that's kind of where I started thinking about teaching English. Because, you know, someone comes up to you and asks you, what are the B verbs? And you don't know and you've spoken English all your life. And you're studying English in the university. You can't answer simple questions like, what are the B verbs? So then I started thinking about it, and then I ended up teaching in university. And while I was teaching in university, uh, I was actually inspired by this one little incident. When we taught, we also gave people a test to assess their standards of English. And one of the questions we asked was, Manjula took the scissors away, blank, the child. And we thought it was a very simple question, and I'm sure all of you know that the answer is Manjula took the scissors away from the child. But for many people who answered that question, lots of them got it wrong, and lots of them said, by the child. Manjula took the scissors away by the child. And so we were all a little, you know, we were all scratching our head and wondering, what's this? Why, is, why are people answering by the child? So one of the teachers decided that he went and ask someone, Nangi, why did you say by the child? And that, Answer was a little worrying and a little uh, got me thinking a little bit because the person answered and said, Aki, I didn't know what scissors meant. Right? So here is kind of what we are dealing with. Where you think some of the things that you think would be very normal and very well accepted, people don't really know. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about English and post war Sri Lanka. Uh, and one of the things is the fact that we've, we've gone through this war, right? And now it's, we've moved on from it. And as we've moved on, and with the Young Researchers Collective, we just finished a research on young people and the issues they're facing in the current context. And we heard them talk about issues of language and employment and how that's important for jobs and all these things. And clearly, all these issues that were kind of pushed under the carpet because of the war are now starting to come to the surface. And language is clearly one of the things that is on the mind of people. And if we're talking about issues post-war, I think it's time we also look to address some of the other issues that cause conflict in our society. So that's where I come to talk about language and class and living by the sword. So what's the big problem with English anyway? You know, it's, it's a language. You can learn it. You know, it happens all the time. We all speak it, I suppose. But what's the big problem with it anyway? So a few days ago, I got an email from a friend of mine. And I won't share that email with you to illustrate my point. He sent it to me with a little commentary saying, this is funny, very well written. So this is the email. So I'm just going to read it out. It's up on the screen as well. National duty first, Dilshan. And that was the subject line, epic. Sri Lankan captain TM Dilshan said, national duty is more important than playing in the Indian Premier League. And Sri Lankan players are committed to return by May 5th. I miss Aurudu this, year, this time because IPL. And I was very upset as I expect to get a lot of things do, doing Ganu Denu. And I'm want, I am wait, wanting to UK now, so I play my country. And I don't know why Sangha, Mahila and Malinga not like I think he, he said. <laughs> he also stated that the fact that he was hopelessly out of touch in the IPL had nothing to do with his decision. Dilshan has arguably been one of the most aggressive batsmen. And his fielding has been exemplary. As of late, he seems to have been weighed down by the heavy load he carries around his neck 
which has also caused him problems at airport security. <laughs> I just getting used to the weight of my new gold chains. I bought Zaveri Baza and Pondi Baza, he said. In the beginning, it made my head swell up. And, but, but after Dr. Elian White gave me white powder, I don't feel anything anymore, he said. He also said he was looking forward to visiting England, as his wife had told him to wait there till July when the summer sales start. <laughs> Dill step my shop and right now, people only come in there to see my picture and wall, on wall, and I hope I get some good England clothes, he said. When questioned about his ability to fit into Sangakkara's shoes, he said, no problem, my shoe size same as Sangha. <laughs> He also said that he would be he would be considering opening the bowling in test cricket as Arjuna Ranatunga had called him and asked him to always lead from the front. <laughs> asked to comment on the news report that the Sri Lankan cricket that Sri Lanka cricket had requested Malinga to return to rehabilitate his injured knees, Dilshan said he was not aware of any problems regarding Malinga's knees. I know his cousin has appendicitis, <laughs> but his niece was always okay and she was quite good looking and fair, he added right. Now, I'm sure you found that a very interesting and funny kind of email. But I now want to ask you a question. What did you find funny about it? Would it have been the same if the person in the email was Sangakkara or Mahel? Would it have still been as funny as you found it? And that's the question I want to post to you today. So you see, when you read that email and some of the things that were said in it, we're actually not just talking about Dilshan. What's funny is not just about Dilshan. What's also funny is about the language he speaks, but also about the kind of lifestyle he leads. So really the humor is about, not just about the language, it's about the lifestyle. Right? And this is not to say, I mean, even I found it funny when I read it, but it, it goes to show that English in Sri Lanka it's not just about a language, it's also about a kind of lifestyle. So in a way, we are laughing at Dilshan because he wears gold chains, because he says things, oh, Sangha's shoe doesn't fit me, you know, Malinga's knees and knees, you know, he couldn't get it. But then why wouldn't we laugh the same way if the same joke was about Mahela or Sangakkara? Because we know we wouldn't find it funny, we wouldn't be silly. So the fact of the matter is that it's a lifestyle. It's not just about knowing the language. It's about how you dress. It's about what you say, how you say it, that you don't wear clothes that are bodé, you know? So it's all these things that are wrapped up in English. And that's where we really come to this issue of English being more than just a language in Sri Lanka. So the funny thing about Sri Lankan English and English in Sri Lanka is that you can immediately tell the difference between someone who speaks good English and someone who doesn't. Uh, I like to relate an anecdote that happened to me when I was uh, in a, at a diner down south and I asked, asked them, you know, what do you have to drink? And they said, sir, we have cork, we have panda, we have Sprite, and we have Fortel. It's like, perfect. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we talk about this, you know, we say, this is not pot English, right? Say, instead of saying not pot, they say not pot, right? And it's very easy to differentiate people, to laugh at people, to say, you know, they're not quite good enough, when they say things a little, you know, that's not quite there. So we laugh at them and we say, okay, they are not, you know, really there. So even sometimes, you, even the most, uh, the, the, the richest people in Sri Lanka, if, we, if they don't really speak, like perhaps I'm trying to speak right now, we might think that they're actually maybe slightly lower class, right? Not really high, upper class because they don't speak English properly. So... That's one thing that we had to deal with in university, uh, about this kind of view that English is seen as this very elite thing, it's tied up with class, and I went to a very leftist, Marxist kind of background university in Caledonia, and so it was one thing that we had to deal with. And we also found that there were lots of students who, you know, they, they swore by the English to Singular Dictionary. They used to take it with them to class, they used to take it with them to the library, and that's how they did their study. They read an English book, they look for words, they find this find, find singular meaning. So one day I spent the night in the hostel and like I went to the hostel and you know there's desks, so there's a small room, and like all of the like just in front of the desk, there's like lists 
uh, pasted on the wall. There are pages and pages of lists. This is a word in English and a singular meaning or singular synonym. Right? So what I found was that people were trying to think in singhala and then write in English. And so they thought it's singular and they found big words, they found words and then they replaced that with the English word. And so you've got some really interesting sentences as a result. And also, yeah, the, one of the things that we started doing was try and ask people, you know, okay, so you want to learn English, but you're not going for classes. There are free classes being offered. Why are you not going? And they said, uh, you know, this is at the English language teaching unit, and they said, uh, Aya, we went on the first day, the teacher looked at us and asked us to introduce ourselves in English, and I never went again. <laughs> right? So now you kind of understand the kind of things that we were working with in university, the kind of background that we were working with. This is the kind of thing that we were trying to change. So what did we do? So we had this group of people, about 40 people, who were like really like interested, let's teach English. You know, let's go and give people what they want. And everyone is saying, you know, oh, we need English for jobs. We need to do that. You know, we need to do this. Please teach us. So we said, cool, let's do this. So what we did was we did a huge publicity campaign, right? And we got the student union on board. You know, generally it's very hard to get student union on board for English teaching stuff. But, you know, the, the president came and painted the posters and we, you know, put them all over campus. And you said, come learn English and stuff like that, right? And then... We found, like, on the day that we were supposed to come, we also went and spoke to the street theater crew and said, you know, can you please do a street drama for us? And they said, yeah, cool, we'll do it. So they came with the street drama. On that day, everything that could go wrong went wrong. It rained. And it, I mean, it didn't just rain, it poured, right? And then there was this huge local politician who was coming, and everyone went for that. So we had, like, this whole thing done, and there were 40 people waiting for, you know, people to teach English, and three people turned up, <laughs> right? And so then we were like scratching our heads and wondering, you know, wow. Because really what we wanted to do was very simple. What we wanted to do was to match people who wanted to learn English with those who were willing to teach. Right? And then we went, we spoke to the English language teaching unit, we got some training, and we said, okay, we're willing to teach. But there's no one who wants to be taught. Right? So then we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves what went wrong. So then we started speaking to people and asking them, you know, we're doing this thing. Why weren't you interested? Didn't you want to come? And the first thing was, oh, it's you who's doing it. We didn't know it. We had told us we would have come. But in it was also a thing of saying, we don't want to admit publicly that we, need, we want to learn English. So that was one of the things that we had to deal with. And then we also realized that there was a sense that English was this very scary thing. The ELTU was a scary place. Right? But you have to also respond to it uh, in a way that kind of makes sense within that context. So what we started doing was we started organizing street theaters. We did uh, an exhibition with the student union, a cultural exhibition. We, talk, we spoke to them about how different people in different places speak English differently. Right? So why, not, why, why is it so hard to think about that here? Then we did this huge like, a, a, a drama. With, it was like 500, 600 people just watching us. Talk, giving them the same message. We worked with the ELTU, and we also told them, we, what we did with the ELTU was we tried to change this perception of English. So we did street theaters with students on their first day, and kind of, you know, we put, put the ELTU as like a boogeyman, and you know, try to scare them and say, oh, English is going to get you. Uh, but we also then went around and, and changed it around at the end and showed them that ELTU is actually trying to help. So because there's also these things that say, oh, the ELQ is a bad, the English language teaching unit is a bad place. They're trying to show you up. But it's not really that. But this is the kind of perceptions that you're dealing with. And, and the larger issue of all of this, and this is why I come back to this thing here of, of this uh, email, is the question of what, how does English work in Sri Lanka? Many of you may or may not know that uh, in, in Singhala, the term for English is Kadda, right? And learning English is known as Kadda Polish Karna, right? And really derives from the word Kadwa, right? Which is actually, the, the, th the thinking behind it was that English is a double-edged sword. With one edge, you maintain your privilege, and with the other, you keep people out, right? And this is the kind of thinking that you have to contend with, especially in a university like Kerenia, where things are so structure. 
So what did we do about it? So we did all these things, and this is some of the things that we finally learned. One was that we had to understand our position. Uh, we were English students, so English students in a you know, university not seen very well. So we had to understand where we stood and why people saw us in certain ways. Two, we had to understand the problem, what was going on. Three, we had to commit the time. We had to get help, we'd be willing to go, and we'd go behind people and say, you know, we'll come and we'll teach you. Finally, we had to work with people to develop their confidence. And I think this is the most important thing for me. Because we found that the biggest obstacle to teaching people English was actually giving them the confidence to actually keep going. Because until and unless they were confident that they were moving forward, they were very scared to come back to class, they were very scared to learn. And what we did mainly was to give people the confidence that this could be done. So to look back at it now, I'm sure you've realized that I'm trying to say that language in Sri Lanka, especially the English language, is a very political issue. And when I say political, I don't mean it in terms of parties and you know, UNP and JVP and UPFA and all that. But political in terms of there's a lot of power involved and we have to understand those power politics. Right? And so what I'm trying to tell you today is not that we should depoliticize the language. There's no way we can remove the politics from the language. But what we can do is to repoliticize it, to change the kind of political thinking behind it. So my challenge to you today is to see if you can think of ways to repoliticize the English language in Sri Lanka. And to kind of end my speech, this is what the B verbs are. Right? <laughs> and the thing is, you know, you know them because you learn English at home, and you speak it like that. And you never really think of it this way, until someone comes and asks you, so what are the B verbs? These are what the B verbs are. Thank you very much for listening to me. These are the people who did this, uh, who, who I'm dedicating this to. But thank you very much. You've been a great audience.